Now, my name is Geert uh, from Synapse. Uh, we create uh, plugins for Revit, as you can see, uh, might see right now on the screen. Uh, our company is located in the Netherlands, uh, next to the uh, Technical University. Uh, we're quite a young company still. Uh, we are now here for uh, more than one year uh, to create new design tools for you in order to uh, to work with it. Um, so our main proposition here is, uh, you can already see it right there in, uh, in Revit. We created our own ribbon with a couple of tools. Uh, from left to right, you can see the financial simulator, the spatial requirements assistant, the data ratio evaluator, the accessibility evaluator, and a fire safety assessor. Because those are five major design objects, uh, objectives you want to meet in order to make a good building design. So um, uh, also what we see, uh, lots of these kind of uh, uh, assessments are done not inside Revit, they're done outside Revit, or they're done manually with creating lines or creating schedules or go to Excel or uh, using other types of software in order to do particular things. And what we try to achieve with Synapse is try to integrate it into your design workflow. So when you're drawing and modeling your model, your building model with Revit, uh, together with that, you can use these kind of assessments in order to uh, uh, optimize your design and, and to do uh, a quicker and, and more uh, easier checking for your building model and your building design. So um, I will show you one slide before we begin. Um, this is the slide I want to show you. Uh, we're here to try to optimize for your design perfection. And uh, this is a business case of EPR architects based in London. Um, well, at concept stage, stage, I save two hours per week on calculating toilets by using Space Requirements Assistant. Even more, the plugin takes the human error factor out of the equation, making toilets checking quicker and easier. So, as signed by Ilse Dupizeni, uh, she's a lead designer of, uh, I spoke to her in person, and uh, to, together with her, we created uh, just one feature called uh, the toilet checking. It's part of the wall design suite uh, we're going to uh, show you. So after all, uh, when adding all the plugins together as a suite, you're gonna save uh, uh, more than a couple of weeks uh, per person per year on calculations. You're gonna uh, even reduce the human error and you will be kept, uh, you will be keeping all the assessments, all the che design checks in sync and customizable with your design. So that's what we're here for. So now let's go to the tools. Let's go to the plugins, what we've created so far. For you. Um, first of all, let's go from left to right to financial. So when doing um, a financial simulator, uh, a fin financial simulation for your building, of course, the most important thing is uh, the cost estimation. How, how much is the building going to cost you or your client? So if I'm going to click it, um, you will see a pop-up screen on top of Revit. And this is our user interface, our Synapse user interface. So at the top, you see a bunch of uh, key performance indicators. Those will show you the instant results of your building design. So in this case, I got a construction cost of $4.5 million, uh, a net present value which is negative, so there's no payoff time, and a negative return on investment. So let's try to increase that. At the left, I see the menu items. So at the first, I can do the cost estimation by using this tab, construction cost, or there's a second tab, and it will cash flow. Uh, so optionally, based on the construction cost, as the initial investment. You can also do an annual cash flow, um, saying what, what's going to be the revenue and what's going to be your maintenance cost uh, over years. Um, what we see a lot is uh, it, it can already help a lot if you can do the cost estimation right from the start. So that's where we're going to start. So at the uh, uh, regarding the construction costs, um, this is the context we are going to work with. At the bottom, you have a couple of uh, tools to move a cost item up or down, move it left or right. So if you want to pick up uh, the industrial as, as a tree, uh, you can make a tree view. So you can play with it around and uh, you can make your own cost template by doing this. 
also as an end result um, um, you can go to uh, a, a chart uh, so what's going to be uh, the cost estimation overview so in this case uh, I got zero parking costs public uh, uh, costs and if you're going to change your cost template at the top so these are the cost templates which are initially um, created by Synapse and you can easily add your own cost templates also uh, so for instance I got the cost template based on the B BCIS that's the building cost international standard so it's doing an elemental costing now and if I'm now going to click on the chart it will totally be changing so for, from facilitating works to superstructure to service building services so uh, up to the risks or buying grounds you can all put it in here um, I will make it a little bit bigger to, for you to show uh, what he's doing. So first of all, you can rename the category. Second of all, you can get any amount out of your building. So in this case, I have put up custom amounts because the toxic hazardous uh, material uh, removal is not uh, drawn. So in this case, I got four times that, that amount. But I can change it. I can change it to the length of beams. I can change it to whatever amount you want to grab out of the building. And I can even add a filter to it. So in the case of, for instance, I just want to get, for the balconies, I want to get the area of the rooms with the name or parameter uh, with a value balcony. I can just simply type in uh, a filter called balcony. So as a result, you will see the amount which you cannot change, which is cut on from the Revit model. And in this case, he's using link models. He's using design options. He's using uh, assemblies, uh, nested families, in order to get the amount out of it. Well, you attach your own price to it, and the cost will be calculated. So it's a, it is up to you how to define the cost template, or it is up to your cost consultant your external customer consultant maybe to define the cost template. But the cool thing is it gives you a, a workflow right inside Revit to work together, to work more closely together on top of your Revit model. So considering you're going to draw another wall, instantly the cost will change. Considering you're going to draw another design option, instantly your cost will change. And to uh, show you how it's, it's linked to the Revit model, uh, we have uh, defined a couple of things. So we can show calculated elements in 3D view. This is a new feature, which is uh, not in the current uh, solution just yet, but there is a major upgrade for financial coming up. Um, then you can show all the calculated elements in the 3D view. In that case, it will be shown which elements are, uh, are, are used over here. I can also say just highlighted in the model. So in that case, that element, the area of the walls, will be highlighted in the model and a proper view will be found. It's, it's the same thing as, um, as, as uh, the reference schedules are able to do. But now you're doing that for a cost template. So what we see a lot of people doing in this case, setting up different schedules, exporting to Excel and do the costing over there. No need to do it anymore. So that's the real benefit here. One side step to the next part, annual cash flow. So if you have your cost, you can see the construction cost now uh, is, uh, is 4 million. Your net present value is uh, $100,000 with a payoff time of 26 years. So if you go to the charts, you can also see it over here. This is the annual cash flow. So you start up with that 4 million and your cash flow will be uh, getting back and at the end of the 26 years you will be having a positive cash flow after the sales of the building uh, you can play with that so if you go to the annual cash flow you can set up the inflation rates so what if I'm going to increase the inflation rates well the net present value obviously will change if I will say all right uh, the building will be sold with twice the amount then uh, the payoff time will not change, but the net present value will change big time. So uh, what if the operating period of the building will last for uh, 20 years longer? Then obviously this will rise a big time. 
So this is a good play for your uh, end client, for your asset manager also to play with it. But it is all based on the construction cost. That's the first thing you want to address. To making sure your design is not exceeding the cost estimation. So I hope uh, you like this part. Oh, there's one thing I uh, forgot to mention. Uh, by um, sharing cost templates with each other, you can either use the input Excel or save as an Excel file. So in that case, you, uh, your colleague or your uh, uh, one of your uh, teammates, uh, design teammates, can also work on the same cost template. So one click of a button and everything goes to Excel. There's also a report button down there uh, to set up the cost inside Word. And this is how it looks like. And if you want to change all the content or your logos or your uh, text fonts, uh, there's a Word template involved with this, so it's easy to change it uh, before you're going to generate this. If you want to know more about that, I, uh, we are happy to explain it. Uh, and you can also uh, touch your knowledge base there. Uh, all right. This is financial. So now you're able, right from the start, when you're drawing masses in Revit, when you're drawing walls, whatever, you can start up your cost estimation. Next step, totally different uh, plugin, totally different purpose. So forget about the costing, it's a different theme. It's called Spatial Requirements Assistant. And in the case of the Spatial Requirements Assistant, uh, we check another couple of items. So I'm going to click on it. Um, the first thing you want to address, and as you can see, the user interface is similar, although the menu items are different. The first thing you're trying to address is the floor area. The most important thing you need to report all the time when design changes or when your feasibility study is done or uh, is the areas of your floor, the areas of office space, retail, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, patient rooms, corridors. Uh, that's the most important thing you're trying to address. And regarding the local standards, well, you got the gross area, the gross floor area, the GFAs. You got your nets. You got your net sellable area even, and um, for lots of people, um, it is uh, when when starting to work with Revit, it is quite a uh, an extensive way of of creating schedules. Uh, you need to create a schedule for the gross internal. You need to create a schedule for the net internal and net sellable, and then also you need to put all the floor plans on the sheet. So that's where Synapse come in quite handy. And what uh, the software is doing over here, he will grab all the areas from the model and he will compare it to each other. So if I go into the settings and if I will group the areas by just a floor level, no second group, and I can define the area type names, gross, internal, net, internal, and that one goes from the gross building, if I've set it up right. And I can even add my own. So. I'm going to add uh, a, an area type name called toilet, maybe even corridor. I like that. So uh, I can I can also compare it from each other because the visual uh, visual comparison between the grows and the nets and the rooms and the spaces that is the thing you're gonna miss in Revit. So in this case, I'm gonna take the rooms, rooms, all right, and then I will include all rooms with the name containing the word anything like toilet. And over here it's like corridor. I can also color it blue. Uh, let's use blue for toilets and the yellow or the all of the, the purple, pink one for the corridors. It doesn't really matter. So another thing is to uh, set up the required values and to uh, calculate the gross and net percentage. We call it the building efficiency. So the building efficiency will be between the gross and the net area. Oh, yes, there we are. And this is the end result. So in this case, at ground floor, I have 979 square meters. And I can also put it to square feet for you in a minute. Uh, 969 square meters of uh, net internal. So that's a little bit less. And the net cellular area will, will be a lot less. Even toilets and corridors and the floor efficiency as an end result will be 83%. No, it's okay. This is too less because I use it over there. Mm. 
Well, the, the real fancy stuff comes here. If you click on the 3D visualization, and instantly he will show you 3D visualization of the building. Um, as you can see, with the toilets located, and with the corridors, where are the corridors located? So it's an easy check uh, where the, the areas are. And you can rotate it, you can move it around, you can use the slider in order to uh, put the areas uh, more, more bound together. And um, what we see lots of uh, people doing, lots of architects and engineers doing this, uh, they use Photoshop for this, because it's simply not doable on Revit, especially if you want to do a 3D visualization like this for high rise. All right, so this is the end result, one overview of your grows and nets. And um, if I press OK, all right, and um, when once I'm going to add a couple of more uh, uh, rooms over there, like let's say uh, just draw a couple of walls. <laughs> Come on, give me walls. Mm. Another five place wall, yeah, forget that. And then I will add another room. And I will say that that is going to be a toilet room. Oh, it's already a corridor. Cool. Yeah, let, let's rename it to the toilet. Then you're going to see the, the, the real, real power here. You're going to reopen the application because I've just changed it. And all of a sudden, the 3D visualization will show you that extra room there. Just two clicks away. And the toilet's now 481 square meters at ground floor. I keep you... I, well, we are European, so we are all metric, but you are American, so I want to change the project units here. Square feet, yes, all right. So it's linked to the uh, uh, the Revit project units, and if you're going to change your project units, it will follow uh, that one. Everything will be translated to. All right. There is also Revit floor plan. I'm not going to click it right now, but um, with one click of a button, all the area plans, which are shown over here, will be pushed to Revit sheet instantly by one click of a button. And then all the area types can, uh, will be pushed on just one floor plan. Next step. We've done the floor area design. Let's go to the next step called toilets. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, when I was an architect, working at an architect's office before we began work, uh, began these new, uh, uh, new tools, um, one of the most challenging things we had was um, uh, counting the number of uh, required toilets. Because it needs to apply to uh, a couple of local standards. And uh, the local standard I was working for, it was in Hong Kong, was a UK-based local standard. Uh, that's called the British Council of Office Guide. And in that case, uh, we exported, we, we manually counted the toilets even though, because uh, we were not that good in Revit yet. <laughs> but now it's easy to count the toilets by using schedules, but it is getting difficult if you want to compare it to the number of persons. So by each number of person, you need to add another toilet in order to know how big the toilet uh, room is going to be. So that's why we at Synapse, we've been thinking, let's let's make a point solution for that, which which just uh, which is just instant to use. So in this case, for you, uh, um, I think uh, a lot of people uh, for you, uh, you're using the international building code or the California plumbing code, which is quite alike. Uh, simply select that one, and then all of a sudden you will see at ground floor you're still missing a female toilet because the table there, you can also uh, show the table. This is the table uh, which is straight out from the uh, local standard. You're miss, still missing one female toilet based on 164 persons at ground floor uh, by people density. So let's add that. All right, so female toilet. We need to add a female toilet. So let's go to the toilets. Toilet female, no, do I have? Ah, I already prepared that. There's a toilet cell there. It's empty. So oh, I can I can just copy that one. And now all of a sudden, when I've added it, I'm going back to the special requirements. And now you see the toilets are all okay. I even have too much now. Well, considering if you're going to change the people density, of course, uh, like like 50 square feet per person, then still you need to have a lot more female toilets. 
but uh, let, let's keep it back to uh, 80, 80 square feet per peer person or predefined values like that one. That's checking the number of toilets and now we can see thinking how do we get those toilets because every toilet has a different definition. Yes, you go to settings. If you go to settings, you can rename your toilet room names. So in that case, he will know what kind of toilet room name purpose it has, a male or female or accessible, uh, and the number of toilets. So knowing how big your toilet room is going to be in an early design phase, it's really important. Um, because after all, when your design is already fixed and you still need to add the toilet, probably you know how, how difficult it's going to be. So to meet these kind of number of toilets requirements is rather important in the early design. So going to the next steps, um, well, we have something called parking spaces. So if you have uh, defined some parkings, we're not doing scheduling here. We're taking up the parking space requirements so for normal disabled and trucks, and he will count the number of valid parking spaces which will meet the criteria. And the last thing, facility rules. Uh, that gives you some, some power to add another rule sets if you're missing a couple of things up there. And to, to conclude uh, this application, uh, the application of the spatial requirements, um, it is checking the amounts. It is checking the amount of toilet, the amount of floor area, and the amount of parking spaces, and those kind of things. If you want to validate your design not by doing the amount of the, the but the free space in inside the toilet area, then we're going to go to the next application. That's called accessibility. Because accessibility can uh, validate uh, your free walking space throughout your building. So let's do that in a minute. Before I first have another one. It's called Daylight Require and Ratio Evaluator. So let's click that one. Totally different tool. So let's forget the number of toilets. Let's forget the uh, floor areas or the financials. Let's talk with the MEP contractor uh, or the MEP engineer. Because the MEP engineer wants to know from you what's going to be your daylight, what's going to be your daylight ratio in order to do your heat calculation, uh, heat load, or cooling load calculations or even um, uh, every living room must have a minimum required value of, of, of illuminance. So in, uh, that's why we created this tool and we're mainly focusing on the part where there's no solution for yet. And the solution is getting the amounts of the windows. So the window to floor ratios and the window to wall ratios. Because um, before you're doing the actual illumines calculation, like with a dialux calculation, you first want to address the number of windows. Where are the windows located? How big are the windows? So that's why we created this tool, because we know in every design it's kind of difficult, it's really difficult to set up all those schedules. One for the windows, one for the doors. So how many glazing do I have within a door? Um, a contractor needs, wants to know that uh, for costing as well. Um, so that's why we created this application, to, to steer you uh, with the right uh, daylight requirements. So it gives you a ground overview of all the rooms, first of all. And you can also set it up by area plans, or you can set it up by floors. and um, there are a couple of more settings you can fill in, so the, the material name of the glazing, where what he needs to get, and the solid materials like the mullions or the spandrel panels, so the solid panels, where we don't want to include, so the, the thing we would want to exclude. And those kind of things can be behind glazing, so although the glazing is transparent, these parts are not. I can set up a minimum height above floor for my glazing, and so there are a couple of things in order to uh, check up the local standards like uh, LEED or uh, the UK Right for Light. So there are lots, lots of worldwide local standards based on this. Um, so first of all, we got the window to floor ratio. And second of all, we got the window to wall ratios. So this is per room and this is per wall. 
And I can also set it up to the north facade. So the north facade in this case uh, is that part. And it's also using the true north here. All right, so this is the ground list of all the data which he generated. So in this case, I got a corridor with lots and lots of uh, glazing or the entrance lobby. So how about the entrance lobby? Highlight the model. Where is that located? It's that one. So it works as a schedule, but now instant. Instant. And these, uh, the, the complexity lies behind knowing these numbers, because these numbers cannot be retrieved by schedules. So now let's talk about the windows. So I got the total list of all the windows, which are there. And um, so he grabs up the system panels, uh, curtain panels, uh, curtain walls with 40 panels, windows, doors. So he grabbed whatever where the glazing material is in. And he will list that. And also the window to floor ratios, there is a required value there. So if you, it, uh, with the ultrafill required values, you can simply uh, load all the required values in automatically based on the uh, room name. And uh, that those values will all be saved in the room itself as well. And now I can set up like, uh, all right, give me the office room, office room nine. So where's that located? That's that room, and it doesn't have any windows. Oh yeah, it doesn't have any windows. That's funny. So let's add a couple of windows there. What we can also do, if you go, uh, you can create an elevation view right from there. And in that case, you're going to have an explanation what the glazing does with that door. So it's a more elaborate way of reporting. So some local standards want that. So that's 25 square feet. And that area, that's the glazing of your door. He's calculated. Six panels, one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, yeah, shading reduction for uh, your shading around the door, lower glazing, transparency factor he can include, whatever you, the G value, for instance. All right. And then, yeah, the visualization. That's the last thing I want to show you. Once you're going to click on that one, uh, you can, uh, 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 those visualizations will be put in Revit. So let's click on the first one. This is the result. So it's like a colored view plan right inside Revit, where the daylight is the highest or the lowest, as you can see. And also, we got another colored view plan. Where do we meet the requirements? So in this case, uh, we set the uh, requirements to a particular daylight for the cinema room, although he hasn't got any daylight there. And for the toilets, it's quite obvious. So that's daylight. Quick daylight checks, and you don't need to know much. The only thing you want to know is, has every room a particular amount of daylight, and does it meet the requirements? So now let's go to the next one, accessibility. I will use another project for that. I think it is a fancy project uh, to show you what the accessibility is doing. So uh, this is an example project, two floors, um, and the cool thing is it, it's got a donut shape because you can walk around a little bit. So then he can decide whether to use that direction or that direction to walk. And why, why am I saying that? Because inside the accessibility, we don't uh, just check the dimensions, but we also check the walking distances. And the walking distances is about your Google Maps indoor navigation. I will show you in a minute. So let's click on it. The accessibility is all right. It's opening right now. And um, this is the result. So what you see based on the Premier and Cleaning Car uh, uh, accessibility profile for cleaning carts. The cleaning cart cannot access those parts of the building, those rooms. The grayed out rooms are not accessible for the cleaning car. And probably because we got a bunch of inaccessible doors. How come? I can see you thinking, how come that door is inaccessible? Because we have set up the minimum door width to 1.5 meters. And the 1.5 meters, and again, um, 
let, let, you can also use feet there, of course. But the 1.5 meters, that's the minimum requirement. So what happens if I'm going to change it to another one, to just the regular pedestrians or to just the American Disabilities Act requirements? Then all of a sudden we can access more, uh, more rooms. Because now all of a sudden the required door width is 0.8 meters. That's about um, uh, three feet. Um, and the three feet, that will be checked for all doors throughout the building. But what you can see over here, we have still a bunch of doors which are not okay. Let's fix that. So first I will go to uh, project units to set up two feet, decimal feet, yeah, all right, all right. And now I'll change the door. I will make one door bigger. Let's make that one door bigger. And let's also make that one door bigger. But I, I still have a small door there. Uh, let's see what he thinks about that. What the software thinks about that. So I will reopen the application. And everything will be recalculated. Let's go back to that, that regular pedestrians. And all of a sudden, those two rooms are now accessible. Although you can still see that that door is inaccessible. And also, uh, the toilets are still inaccessible. But this is just one example, guys. It's just checking the doors. We can check a lot more. For instance, we can check the minimum passage width. And a minimum passage width, I uh, can demonstrate it uh, like this. Let's set the minimum passage width to four feet. All right. Yeah, right, give me that four point hello. No, it's not willing to do that for me. Uh, let's just change. All right, but uh, the the thing is, if I'm going to have some kind of a wall right there, for instance, and that wall is going to be like this. That's this is what you see a lot there. Eh? If you're gonna attach a link model, and all of a sudden your MEP. Uh, guys have said oh, there needs to be some more pipes and let's add them on another shaft there and all of a sudden your coder will be smaller but in this case yeah well it's it, it's an obvious change but sometimes the change can be a lot less and you want to check that and that's what we check so if you go back to the accessibility evaluator and if you're gonna go and change that that minimum coder width over there you can you see it already a little bit, but um, he can say that if I'm going to change that there, if I'm going to change the minimum passage width over there, all of a sudden that part of the building is not accessible anymore. And also I can include furnitures for measuring clearances. So the same thing over here to measure all the rooms, I can say, oh, or I'd also do that for all the spaces around furnitures and around the staircase. Staircase is already included. Staircase over there to uh, walk on. And also the minimum width on the staircase can be checked automatically on the same uh, uh, calculation. Or if that, um, that, that table is a little bit too uh, much uh, bound to, to, the board, uh, to the rim, like this, then probably people cannot access to the furthest chair away. So those kind of things we can check. So now let's go to the, um, the accessible uh, accessible areas. Um, right. um, the uh, maximum walking distance, that's what I mean, sorry about that. So the maximum walking distance will calculate the distance between any room and the front door. So what's going to be the maximum walking distance to access the building? That's the main task over here. So in this case, let's look at the meeting room. 124 me, uh, uh, feet in length. And this is how people will walk. You see? So they will use this front door and they will go around there and there and there, and there in order to access that. Why is he not using that door? That's a good question. Or that door. That's also possible. Let's change that. 23, let, let's keep that in mind. 23 meeting room, 24 feet. 
because you can set up this door as a building entrance. And I haven't set it up just yet. So in this case, and I can also enable it for this one, building entrance. If I'm going to reopen the application, then all of a sudden 23 meeting room will change the length. Oh, yeah, regular pedestrians, yep, yeah. all right. All of a sudden it's now, oh, 23, it's 44 feet. Let's look it up. How does it look like? Yeah, now he's checking up the path from there. So, and he does that for all the things. So I can also go to the upper level, like the, uh, well, let's use office 40. Office room with the number 40. Ah, uh, he uses that, that for a door. I need to disable that. Sorry. Uh, so that, he thinks that's a front door as well. I will disable that building entrance over there because that's a fire exit. And that's another thing that's for the fire safety. So let's open it again. All right. Yeah, go back to pedestrians. Yep. All right. So now let's go back to uh, room office 40. And that's going to be 80 two feet and this is how people will walk there you go they will walk from that front door they will walk up the staircase in order to access that that room and you can also show 42 office or maybe even uh, 44 office to know how people will walk and all of a sudden he will choose a different front door because it's shorter the distance is shorter so this distance and we also call it the google maps navigation for your uh, Revit uh, model, um, you can check out the distances. And this is the distance for the accessibility. So to access the building, because we're talking about ac uh, building accessibility. And to understand how people will walk in order to, uh, 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 for the clearances as well. Because if you set up the clearances with a minimum corridor with it and the doors, door sizes, you will choose a different path and in that way he can understand which room is accessible or not. But another thing which he can do now is checking up distances. And this is kind of a new thing in um, um, distance rules. And lots of people also call this the proximities of rooms. So if you're doing floor plan layout design, you want to have a toilet not too far away from your uh, school uh, room, so your, your educational room where the children are sitting. And also um, a printer needs to be close by, so a coffee corner needs to be close by and not too far away. And those kind of checks. And it, when, it, when it comes to hospitals, it's even more important because you want to measure the total distance uh, one of the employees is going to walk every day. And to be sure he's not getting tired after 12 hours of work. So the, um, the floor plan uh, design for hospitals is the most complex design ever. And that's why we've added these walking distance checks. So let's set up an example. I want to go from, um, let's say I want to go from office 10, I want to go to uh, office or meeting room. How far I'm going to walk, and that the requirement, I can even set up a requirement, maximum distance. All right, let's see. So the distance between office room and meeting room 21, that's 166. This is how it looks like. Now, the other one, let's go from any office to any meeting room instead. Let's check it out. That's a maximum of 202 feet and an average of 86 feet. So you see some offices are too far away from the meeting room. So let's see what happens there. So in this case, he will show you all the offices which are too far away according to your set requirements. And all the green lines 
are okay. So as you see probably I need to add another meeting room at the upper floor in order to meet the requirements. So it's up to you to set the requirements, but when you're getting there you can automatically check that. And we call this the proximity of any building types. And you cannot just do that for rooms. Uh, you can also do that for family type instances. So uh, it will list all the doors, curtain panels, masks, but even more important, the plumbing fixtures. So give me the closest direction to, uh, to a toilet. Give me the closest uh, direction to uh, a dining table or to that printer I was talking about, or to the reception. So think about it, what you can do with this. What we can do with this is another thing. We have just been talking about going from the outside to the inside of the building, called the accessibility, but what if you're already inside and you want to go outside? So we call that fire safety. Uh, the egress of your building, not just for fire safety, but also for when there's a hazard, it's really interesting to address already in the early design phase. Because it's about life and it's about life safety and it's about your building performance as well. And especially when doing high-rise buildings. High-rise buildings, I've, I've, I've designed a high-rise building myself once and the most important thing was there uh, to design the central core of your high-rise building. And the central core must contain the toilets, that's what we have a solution for, um, the number of elevators and also the number of staircases and the width of the staircases. And especially the last one, you can check that with a fire safety assessor. Uh, the number of fire exits, the number of corridors and then the number of staircases are really directly related to your fire exit plan, the fire exit strategy plan. So although lots of uh, designers and architects say, oh, let's outsource that to one of the biggest engineers, uh, uh, which uh, so I, I can focus on my own design, for sure they will come back with some feedback, uh, let's make that staircase wider. So uh, we are aiming here for the doing 80% right about your fire safety design. And also, fire safety is, is about the, one of the most interesting things, uh, not doing and not saying anything about, uh, just about the architectural design, but also it's saying a lot about structural design. It's saying a lot about MEP design and even the facility management regarding your maintenance of your uh, fire plan and uh, your fire exit strategies. So that's why we at Synapse think fire safety is really addressable where uh, within the BIM workflow. So first, what he's doing, fire compartments. He is check uh, the, the software is checking the fire compartments you have defined in your model, and you can define it by. And if I go to settings, you can see it. You can define it by room parameters, wall parameters, like fire ratings in your wall, and also area plans. And I think. That's the commonly used one in the early design phase. So I have created another area plan called fire compartment. And um, based on that, I will uh, click OK now. Based on that, everything can, will be uh, recalculated now. And you, you're going to see three compartments. One, two, three. So I've got two compartments at level one. One, two. And another compartment at level two. So based on that, he will calculate the total areas of those compartments. And as you can know, the, the National Fire Protection Agency, uh, the uh, standard 101B, tells you something about the egress distance, fire exit width requirements, and the areas, maximum areas of fire compartments. And those three things, he, uh, the software will check for you automatically. The only thing you need to do is set up the fire compartments. So in the case of the, um, um, the fire exit width, you can see the level uh, compartment three at level one is not good. Because of the 107 persons inside that, that compartment density, um, he does, it does not meet the requirements. But if I'm going to um, add a couple of more doors, for sure it will meet the requirements or if I will reduce the number of persons inside that compartment, that's in this case the easiest one to change, you can see 
the fire exit will meet the number of persons. And it's just a way of not, um, setting up a requirement that within a certain amount of time, all the persons can flee from the fire compartment as fast as possible. There's another thing we can calculate for that. That's about the egress time. I will explain that in a minute. Let's go to the egress distance. Egress distance is a different thing we're going to uh, check. The egress distance is the distance within the fire compartment in order to egress. And this is the maximum of 100 feet. And I initially set up the maximum of 100 feet. So the egress path must be less than 100 feet. And in this case, it's working. This is the one. And yeah, now you can see he's checking up the minimum corridor width over there as well. All right. And this is the egress distance, which is out of reach. That's not good. Talking about the egress time, that's another thing. So um, if I've set up, uh, let's go back to the 107 persons inside of the compartment. Uh, you can see the egress time uh, for 307 persons in total will be around 50 seconds. That's not a lot. So what happens if I'm going to increase the number of people inside of the compartment to, let's say, 800? I don't know if he's going to be... Oh, that's possible. It's going to be big party party going on over there. Let's make that to 1200 even. And your egress time will increase. And in that case, you, you know if you're going to organize a party in your, inside your building, you know you need to have a fire department watching there. All right. But what happens if I'm going to close this application? I will delete a couple of things. Like I will delete that door. I will delete that door. I will delete that staircase even though. So I got lots of less, a lot less um, ways to egress, uh, to exit the building. Reopen the application and the application will recalculate the egress time. So 325 minutes and there's even no egress path found now at level two for, for one uh, egress. Um, and that's cool. 325. So what, what happens if I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I think that's... Uh, yeah, right. Uh, let's open it again. Yeah, what happens if I'm going to make it 1,500 persons? Well, it will rise. Egress time, and, and this is how, how you can see what, what's happening. So, uh, per timesheet, from zero to uh, the end of the time, you'll see how many people will be there inside the compartment. I can even see that per room. And by room, you can also see how people will flee. So, that's the room, and this is how people will walk going down. You see? And then it's outside. So, they will use this egress path. Probably because this exit door is crowded with other people. Um, you can also check another one. Let's use this one, for instance. They will flee to that door. They are there the first. And I can also show them in a 3D animation. So click on the play button, and then you're going to see how people will exit the building. Still people waiting there. And now everything is empty. So I'm thinking you're doing this for high rise. And the last thing I want to show you, uh, that's, that's kind of a, uh, an extra, it's for MEP, that's a fire hose coverage. And if you have drawn a fire hose, it's right there, uh, it will relocate that and it will draw a fire hose reach. So if you're not doing sprinklers, you're doing fire hoses or, or extinguishers, you can set up those elements there and get it can grab the length and then it will visualize how far the firehouse can reach and how far the water can reach. And as you can also see, the yellow lines are the fire compartments. So the firehouse cannot go to another fire compartment. It must be remain closed during fire. And the firehouse coverage in this case is 42%. So I still need to cover uh, another 58% to add another fire hoses or make the hoses longer 
or change the hug poppins. And it, as you can see, it's all related to each other. So going back to all the five applications, um, the, uh, the accessibility will tell you something about the fire safety as well. And if you're going to add an, add an element, it will have an effect on your financial. If you're going to add a room or if you're going to add another part of the building, it will also have a beneficial effect on that you need to add another toilet or you need uh, or your area ratio will change or your required area will change. And every time you're doing design changes, you're doing design scenarios, you want to check all these. And that's why we at Synapse have created those tools for you in order to validate your design as your model. So this is my demo for now. And I hope there are a bunch of questions which I can answer right away within the last five minutes. So let's go to the questions. I don't currently see any questions. Um, if you have any questions, please type those in now. We'll give them a couple of minutes. To... I, I see one question of Kelsey Cruz, uh, but it's not a question just yet, so maybe she has a question. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, might be from when we asked them to introduce themselves at the beginning. Ah, uh, nice. I'm yes. guessing, but... Well, there's one thing I can I can explain you uh, right now. Um, these tools are sold as a suite. Uh, Applied Software can explain you lots of things about uh, how to buy them and how to purchase them. They come with a free seven-day trial. And if you want to extend your trial or you want to pilot, uh, please ask Applied Software for that. And they are more than happy to help you. Uh, we are here to learn from you guys as well. Um, so if you have any feedback about our applications, please share it with us. Um, there are lots of more, as I just told you, there are lots of more features coming uh, to you in a, in a couple of months also. And um, there are features about uh, what I show you. There's going to be a major upgrade for Financial Simulator coming up. We're totally happy uh, to show you that. Uh, advanced filtering, uh, better visualizations for your financials. Um, also, the accessibility evaluator. Um, in the current uh, uh, version, there is no uh, furniture checking, but this version, uh, as I just showed you, has included the furniture. If you want to know more about the, uh, our current tools, there are a couple of things you can uh, also uh, 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 search for. www.synapse.com. If you go to synapse.com, we got a couple of uh, uh, YouTube videos with a more enhanced explanation about our tools. They're all there, 10 minute videos. Check out more videos. And uh, also, if you go to the, the, the tab solution, you uh, are going to understand what's going to be the prices uh, of, of the plugins are. Um, don't get scared of the prices. It's a startup fee. So uh, this is just single user. And if you want to stack additional plugins, you're just going to pay that amount. And uh, it gets more interested, interesting once you're going to say, all right, I want all the tools for a couple of people working inside my office. Because uh, every design team should have these kind of design tools. Then you can buy a local team. And the local team is about a floating license. So the floating license you can use for any user. Um, whatever. 